so although this is titled um, Information Extraction of ChatGPT, um, it's, it's also about large language models in general. Um, so we're starting at four. Uh, so this is the new schedule. Uh, we had our 20 minute break. This will be about an hour and a half, uh, maybe about an hour and 40 minutes or so. And then um, what's really important, and I'll emphasize this, is for people to stick around uh, to the end. We're trying to save the best for the last so we have most people sticking around. Um, so we can do the survey and also some closing remarks for people. Uh, it's really important that we get your feedback and if we can make any improvements or get some of your suggestions for future versions of this course. So um, we have a bunch of objectives. We're going to learn about ChatGPT. And I know that we did a bit of a survey at the beginning of this course to find out how many people have either heard of or used ChatGPT. And almost everyone has, which is good. Uh, we're going to be talking about large language models, or LLMs, and how they work, a little bit of their um, inner workings. We're going to learn about prompt engineering. And again, maybe we could do a little bit of a survey about um, people's familiarity with prompt engineering, um, because that's actually a really, really important skill. And in fact, prompt engineers now, and most of them are employed in California, earn as much as uh, some of the top um, programmers. So they're getting salaries of you know, 300, 400,000 a year. Um, we'll learn about other options that are um, either comparable to ChatGPT, or in some cases better or free. Uh, we're gonna show you some simple examples of how ChatGPT can be used to do programming. Um, and this is another survey question I'd like to ask if we could do, which is how many people have actually used ChatGPT to help them program. And then we're gonna talk about information extraction and how you can use that in a variety of things. Um, a little bit about in-context learning with chatbots. Um, and, um, and then we'll learn about at least more show and tell of how LLMs are now being used in bioinformatics. And I've hinted at this a few times before, um, but they are transforming um, how machine learning is being used in, in bioinformatics. So uh, this is uh, a screenshot of ChatGPT, um, of when it, at least the home pages as they produced it when it was developed it was OpenAI. Interesting, OpenAI was originally started as a not-for-profit and had a lot of um, fairly influential people on its board who were, you know, from the perspective of AI for the good. Um, but um, it changed um, and it switched for a for-profit model, I think about 2020. Uh, and that was when Microsoft put in a lot of money into it. And those of you who use Microsoft products are probably aware that, that Bing, which is their search engine, is now largely powered with ChatGPT, which put Google uh, in a rather awkward position. So OpenAI is, I guess, a, if you want a connection or linked tightly with, with Microsoft, OpenAI released um, ChatGPT on November 30th. And that version of 2022, and that was called version 3.5. Um, I'd mentioned this before that the original cost of the development was about 700 million, hundreds of people working on it. Uh, the story is that when they released it in November 22, they programmers didn't think much of it. You know, they thought it was pretty good. And essentially, um, people who had been working in um, pre-trained transformer field had been getting you know decent performance. Um, and, and so large language models are a niche. Um, people were aware that you could get, you know, nice answers, you could do things. But because OpenAI released it uh, and had, you know, done a fair bit of hard work to improve over existing models and they made it a web server and made it free, um, it surprised everyone, including the people who developed it. it. They were surprised at the uptake. They were surprised at some of its performance. And what it showed was that, you know, the more data you put in, the more parameters you have, the more text you train, the better it got. And 
um, version 3.5 kind of passed the magic threshold. Version 3 was sort of bouncing around, or almost free versions were bouncing around in the academic world. But most people didn't have the GPU power to, to really run these things. And because Open Ed had gotten a billion dollars from Microsoft, they invested in, in a lot of GPU power. Um, and so they made this much more accessible to many, many more people. Now, for those of you who don't understand the principles of ChatGPT, as I say, just think of it as a, um, um, an autofill or auto-suggest on steroids. So if you use text or email that does autofill, it usually will do maybe one word, sometimes two words. Um, uh, maybe email, it might get three or four words. Um, but what ChatGPT and other large language models is are able to do is they can generate hundreds of words um, at a time. So this is a short history. Um, so they started work on um, generative models for ChatGPT. They described ChatGPT or GPT-2 in 2019. Uh, so that was an open source uh, version, I believe. Um, and then uh, in January, um, this is before they really produced it, they produced a, an instruct version of GPTs. So these are things that can follow directions. Um, and this is, it's important to distinguish between instruct versions and non-instruct versions. Because um, if you modify an instruct version, then it can take um, commands or prompts and understand them much more precisely. And you can fine tune those prompts um, so that things are better. So November 30th, that was the big day. That was when ChatGPT was released as a web service and it opened the power of large language models to the public. And as I said, it was known to many of the people who had worked in that field that these things are pretty, pretty powerful. But that was a small number, maybe a few hundred people. And uh, because ChatGPT and OpenAI had done a fair bit of what was called reinforcement learning to make sure the answer quality was better. They invested a fair bit of money. The quality um, of the results for ChatGPT 3.5 were was, was a step jump. They released ChatGPT Plus so in February. So that's when you could go from the free model to actually buying access. And the subscription is typically $20 a month. Microsoft connected with ChatGPT through Bing. That was their plan all along. Um, the APIs came out in March. ChatGPT4 came out also in March. And for those who have used ChatGPT4, uh, improvement over 3.5 is quite significant. And again, I don't know, Nia, if we could do another survey about um, how many people have used ChatGPT4 or 4, 4, 4, 0 or 4 mini. Um, plugins were introduced, uh, operating system iOS for Mac for ChatGPT in May, um, Bing with GPT also in May, user prompts um, to ChatGPT. Um, an issue with ChatGPT that people brought up and have brought up frequently is the tendency for ChatGPT to hallucinate. So hallucinations are a phenomenon when um, the chat bot is responding to a query or make, describing something and it's basically making stuff up. So one of the tricks people would do is they'd ask it to write a biography about themselves, uh, particularly academics. And a lot of academics have Wikipedia pages and or web pages. And when they'd ask ChatGPT to make or write something about them, you know, either reasonably well-known academic or uh, maybe even well-known celebrities, it, it would just make random things up. Um, it would make up references and citations. It would come up with weird numbers. And this is a characteristic first that ChatGPT was only using data that it had mined up till about 2021. Um, and so it wasn't using the web, it wasn't accessing other resources. And, and so and the fix for accuracy and hallucination was key. Um, September, it started adding um, more um, retention information uh, so that GPT would remember what your, who you were. 
And this has been how a lot of chatbots are developed for, um, I don't know, I guess there's sort of pseudo virtual dating apps where people communicate with what they think is a human, um, but which is actually just a bot. But this is, uh, it's important that the bot remember who they are communicating with uh, rather than saying, you know, ghosting and say, I've never seen you before. Um, DALI uh, is a tool that uses similar concepts to large language models, but it uses image data. And so it's able to um, synthesize images or create synthetic images uh, using instructions. And um, DALI was originally available in 2022, I think, and variations of that. But now it's, it's fully integrated with ChatGPT4. Um, longer context windows with ChatGPT4 in November, the ChatGPT Store, GPT4 Omni, um, which is more capable uh, and can work faster. And then July was a GPT4 Mini, which basically replaces ChatGPT 3.5, which is now considered out of date. So I'm going to stop here. And I, I don't know, Mia, if you were able to get some survey results from, from people about um, things. So a few people have answered. Um, and of the eight who have answered, uh, everyone has used GPT-4. Um, uh, up to 10 now. Yep, everyone's used GPT-4. Um, so if you haven't yet, that's in the Slack. OK, great. So ChatGPT is a large language model. And um, what the large language model is, you know, we've looked at our weight matrices for some of the ones we've built, and they're you know, numbering a few dozen. But with the large language models, the weight matrices have billions. And they are trained on billions to trillions of words scraped from the internet. Um, so um, to, to do that kind of scale, when you're talking about weight matrices of billions of parameters uh, and processing, not a few hundred examples like with um, our, our little tests with secondary structure or genes, um, you have to use uh, AI accelerators or GPU systems. So if you wanted to make a, a 12 billion parameter large language model, which is a fairly modest size these days, so chat GPT is thought to be around five or 600 billion, Lama 3.1 is about 405 billion. The ones that we can run on our computers, which are pretty big, is about 70 billion. So a 12 billion parameter one uh, would require a foundational model, 72,000 hours. So if you had a single GPU, you know, we're talking about many years, you'd have to use um, the dozens of GPUs to sort of do it in a reasonable amount of time. So that's the cost now of creating a foundational model. So a large language model uses what they call tokenization, uh, where words uh, or letters, a token is about four letters, so it's a short word, to write and interpret text. So this is like hexamer statistics in DNA, and we learned about that today. Um, and what they do is they take the data, the text data, into what are called n-grams. Um, and that's sort of um, taken, if you look at the example text, tokenizer, colon, texts, arrows, series of numerical tokens. And if you're turking, you know, breaking things into n-grams, it might say, oh, there's a word token, there's a word iser, there's a, a word texts, there's a, an arrow, there's series, there's of, there's numerical, and it might parse things. And it, it'll, it'll indicate um, or provide numbers uh, to these tokens. Um, Anyways, that's how it's parsed out. That's sort of the, just like you can think about codons and hexamers, that's how they've done that. And what the GPTs, generative pre-trained transformers learn is the probabilities of these tokens appearing one after the other. 
um, through repeated training and optimization, which is the you know, learning process that we learned or um, experimented with over the last two days. So as I say, think of it as you know, codon or hexamers, um, you know, but you know, obviously text has spaces between it and it also has ways of you know, breaking things up into um, um, word segments that um, can be hyphenated. And, um, but that's, that's what large language models do. And you can see that not only can it be adapted to English or French text, but um, sequences in DNA and protein. What you do after you build the foundational model is you can fine tune them. And, and that's this, what we call transfer learning is another term. Um, and so after the foundational model was built for ChatGPT you know, in 2021, it was fine tuned and refined. And it was done through a variety of methods. Um, one approach was reinforcement learning from human feedback. So ChatGPT hired um, hundreds of people to look at the output and then manually edit or rank the output that ChatGPT was doing. And you know, if ChatGPT made something that was really poor and we ranked poor, the corrected uh, result would be given to it, and then it would you know, retrain it through fine tuning or transfer learning. And in reinforcement learning, we talked about at the very beginning, and it, it helps improve things. Um, and it's been very useful for um, you know, auto driving cars but it also seemed to be really improved, useful for improving uh, generative text. Um, the reason why they put ChatGPT out on the web wasn't to make money. They actually put it out there because they wanted more user feedback, uh, which they got. Um, but then they also realized that a lot of people just wanted to use it um, as a tool. Um, anyways, this, this self-instruction um, is another way of bootstrapping the quality of the pump responses and, and so it's been fairly effective. Um, I'm just going to hop in. There's a question in the Slack. On the last slide, the same text has different numerical values. I thought that they would be the same. So you can see that the, there's token is 30,001 and then you can see tokens. It's broken into a T and an O, K and an N's. So the T is 83, O, K is 42 and ends is 61, but, you know, tokens is broken up as three units. Three it, units. It, was, it was the quote mark I was looking at. Is that because it's the quote space? It's got spaces with it? I just wondered why it's it was. Beginning quote and an end quote. So it's just trying to distinguish between. Uh, okay. Ah, oh, cool. Thank you. Um. All right, so we're, we're just talking about the size, and this is a graph that's kind of interesting. So, you know, large language models, GPT back in 2017, had 100 million parameters. BERT, which is public, has about 110 million uh, parameters. Well, there's some that are getting up to 300. Well, actually, it looks like there, it's 370 million. I've seen BERTs down to 110 million. Uh, GPT-2 uh, came out with about a billion parameters, and then, um, as I say, Llama 3, Chat GPT 4, well, Chat GPT 3 is about 100, 100 and 200 billion parameters. But the biggest ones are somewhere around a trillion parameters now. Um, there's been nice tricks to actually shrink these things uh, through quantization. But, you know, just like People are showing you know, growth in CPUs and CPU speed or growth in lithium ion battery performance. This is exactly what we're seeing with large language models. Um, the other graphs on the right are sort of um, showing various uh, GPT models, um, whether you can access them. So GPT-2, you can get source code. BART, you can get source code. BERT, you can get source code. Uh, Palm, you can't. Um, and Lambda, you can't. Um, this is a little dated, but it's just an indication of what the, the size of these, whether they have open access, whether they can perform uh, information extraction, text classification, conversational AI. And those depend very much on whether 
They are one-way or two-way transformer models. So GPT is a two-way transformer model, and so it excels at you know, sort of conversational AI. Um, and then you know, GPT-3 um, is good for content generation, summarization. Uh, the information extraction and text classification is certainly something that BERT excels at. And uh, that's something that um, Mark and his team will have to be exploring a little bit more. But as you grow the size, it seems that these models get progressively better at understanding syntax and semantics and ontologies that we find all intuitive with language. Um, but that was something that the early LLMs really didn't do so well. But now as they reach that threshold, somewhere around 10 to 15 billion parameters, uh, you get that, that jump. Uh, this again is just showing these the size of these um, models. So GPT-1 was 117 million, BERT 340 million. Um, this is when they go up to Ernie or GPT-2, there's billions. Um, but as you get up to chat GPT-3, it's 175 billion, Palm 540, GPT-4, think people think it's close to a trillion parameters. So that's a trillion weights in your matrix. So what are people using ChatGPT for? I'm sure those of you who applied it to a few things. Um, a lot of what the scientific world likes it for is information extraction, question answering, topic summarization. Um, but lots of people have found it's really useful for cover letter writing. And I'd strongly recommend it for people because typically uh, the letters that, that people write by hand, unless you're a really, really strong writer, are kind of weak. Uh, whatever it is they've done or trained ChatGPT with, uh, if you provide your resume information, uh, it'll put together a very nice letter. People use it for trip planning, uh, providing tr professional advice. And I give it a link here that gives you um, a set of prompts to get professional advice. Grammar checking, coding and coding advice. And I guess this is another survey we wanted to find out is how many of you guys have actually used GPT to help code. It's great for adding code comments. It's also great for explaining code. Uh, people do it for food. People do it for poetry and music, essay, story writing. People have already written a number of scientific papers, mostly as a proof of principle or an issue of trying to identify scientific fraud. There's discussions about using it for um, scientific paper refereeing. Uh, people can and have used ChatGPT or variations for translation to different languages, to doing um, web summarization. Role playing, as I say, it's often used in sort of these dating apps. Um, or at least not dating, but virtual uh, partner finding apps. Um, people have used it for generating ad copy. Um, it actually can be very useful for brainstorming ideas. Image generation with DALI. A number of companies are using it to deal with FAQs. Um, solving riddles, puzzles, crosswords, um, even musical chords for given sets of lyrics gift recommendation, classification, the list goes on. And this is only sort of scratching the surface. And most people only use ChatGPT for maybe one or two of its potential applications, but these are, um, there's lots more that it could or should be used for. The reason why ChatGPT kind of took the world by storm is that people did a few experiments just with ChatGPT3 and then later with ChatGPT4. And this is sort of its ranking or performance um, in different areas. So taking SAT uh, SATs, it would score on the top 90th percentile. Uh, advanced placement exams, uh, which are also things where you, you know, determine what university you go to. The graduate record exam to get into grad school would, would score at the very, very top. Um, graduate record writing, the LSAT or legal law test 
it would pass and get ex accepted in most high-end schools. So it can do physics, biology, economics, uh, math, uh, chemistry, um, the bar exam, uh, chat GPT uh, could probably do better than most lawyers. Um, there are some things that it doesn't do so well. So calculus is where it didn't thrive, but this is a case where in some cases you needed the capacity to have or see images. So the performance of chat GPT as a rule is quite a bit better than um, some of the brightest people you know, and quite a bit better than what most of us could do. Um, and as I say, this is just, just um, some of the earlier versions of chat GPT. These again are some of the, the test numbers. So 1410 out of 1600 on the SAT, that would get you into universities like um, Harvard and Yale in many cases. GRE would also get you in anywhere. Olympiad exam was another one that was very surprising. Um, MBA exams passed, medical licensing exams, it just passed. Uh, introductory sommelier, certified and advanced sommelier exams. Um, even though it can't spell, it certainly knows enough about wines um, to do uh, as good as expert sommeliers. So when it was released in 2021, the, the knowledge was limited to, or 2022 was limited to data that it collected up to 2021, that has changed. Um, likewise, being able to look up Wikipedia entries, that has also changed. And being able to access the internet, it's a little limited, uh, but that's changing. Um, being able to tell time, being able to do simple math, I guess that's limited, although I think with version four and Omni, I think it's, it's doing okay. Open-ended questions, you know, what is the meaning of life sort of thing, uh, it won't give you a good answer. Citations and references still doesn't do a very good job um, and still has a tendency to hallucinate. Um, so these are still known limitations, although as I say, the current knowledge is up to date. Maybe I should make the slide a little more up to date too. So if you want to use, if you've never used ChatGPT, um, I think there's a couple who hadn't, um, you can go to uh, openai.com or just Google search for ChatGPT. And you can um, create an account. Um, that's a free account um, that allows you to use it. There used to be long wait times. You can also pay, uh, which is $20 a month, and you can get access to ChatGPT uh, Omni or ChatGPT4. So when you sign in, whether it's the free or the paid one, you still have to enter a name and a password and, and it opens it up into this is the function. Now the layout differs, I think. Um, I have a paid version. This was the free version. I'm not sure if they've changed. So GPT-3 or GPT, um, whatever the turbo one is, is the, the free one everyone gets. GPT-4 is the locked one that you have to pay for. Um, you can type in a query, you know, explain what hidden Markov models are, um, and it will produce a pretty useful uh, response. And this is 3.5, so if you asked it for version four, it would give you much more detailed responses. Um, and you know what are hidden Markov models is relatively open-ended, but at least it's you know specific enough to say, you know, here's the name of the tools. As I say, you know, what's the meaning of life? You're not going to get a great answer. So if you pay to ChatGPT Plus, um, you can get access to the versions Turbo 4 for Omni 4 Mini. Um, things are faster uh, with the Plus version. Um, and you can interact with the model as many times as you want. Um, you can download it and install it on um, your computers. Uh, or other devices, uh, but there are limitations about regions or countries. Um, again, maybe if we could have a quick survey, um, yeah, about how many people have a Chat GPT Plus uh, subscription. Sure. 
So in addition to ChatGPT, you can go through an application programming interface and API. So this allows you to integrate ChatGPT into various products, services, or applications. So you can have uh, customized chatbots that um, um, run in your organization, your lab, your company, whatever. So you have to sign up for an API key and, and follow the, the rules or um, documentation to get it. But this is something that's available, and it's you know it's not only ChatGPT. There are many of the um, chatbot or LLM uh, groups now offer things modeled very much after ChatGPT. Um, so API is one thing, plus is another. Uh, API has a different pricing model uh, depending on the model you use. Um, you can buy tokens, and so there's pricing here for the different ones. The pricing here is maybe a little dated. Um, so they're changing all the time. But typically, if you're using an API, um, and you're having it crunch away, it does cost. But um, for the type of services that most people use, it's maybe a few dollars a month. Um, So Nia, did you get any response in terms of people uh, with any of the other survey questions? Yeah, some interesting stuff. So most people have used ChatGPT to help with coding, but most people do not have a ChatGPT Plus subscription, although it's close. Okay. Um, so obviously things are more expensive when you use higher end ones. The ChatGPT3 model um, at the time, and I think that's still the case, is the only one that allows you to do uh, fine tuning or um, modifications. Um, I'm giving some perhaps dated prices for uh, GPT-4 in terms of the cost per tokens. Um, ChatGPT-3 are called DaVinci. There's a training cost as well. Uh, and when you do training, uh, it's much more expensive. So um, it's because of the cost, particularly for training and fine tuning, that a lot of people have moved away from ChatGPT to create sort of their own custom chatbots and then to use what are called open source models. Um, so there's a number of specialized ChatGPTs. Um, there's one called Bioinformatics Buddy, uh, which is essentially one that was designed and, and customized to deal with um, bioinformatics tools. Um, I don't know, has anyone ever heard of Bioinformatics Buddy? Again, I'll have to trust on Nia or Tanvir or anyone else to tell me if, if anyone has put a thumbs up. Uh, one person has. One person has heard of Bioinformatics Buddy. One person has not. Okay. So I'll say half of you then. Um, this is an example of image generation. Um, and this is where DALI has been incorporated in the third version. And so I just asked it to generate a, um, an image of um, alpha fold two, or it you know, provides an indication of what it does. The tendencies for DALI is that it makes really complicated um, images uh, with lots of detail. Anything that's scientific, it always throws in a microscope, no matter what. Um, but um, people have made some pretty spectacular looking images and uh, the better images are ones that have been, um, we'll say prompt engineered. So maybe again, just as a survey, um, is to find out whether it's thumbs up or the Slack channels, how many people have used DALI or similar tools to help create images either for slides, PowerPoints, splash screens, or other things. So when you're using a tool like ChatGPT, or whether you're using DALI 3 or using uh, it to help with coding or to help with any task, it's important to make sure that your requests or your queries are very specific and well-crafted. 
And, and so this has sort of created a new field called prompt engineering, which is not unlike programming, but it's programming in, in free text. So it's you know, giving a computer instructions in English. It's like giving a person instructions in English. So if you can imagine a child in your kitchen and you're asking them to make brownies and you're sitting in another room. Uh, and if they've never cooked before, you'd have to you know, say, rather than just say, make a pan of brownies, uh, you'd have to start and say, first of all, find a pan that is you know, nine inches by nine inches and has a depth of two and a half inches uh, that's under the shelf by you know, the stove. That give very specific instructions, and you have to go through everything from step by step to step with and how to mix things, where to find the ingredients. Um, so, if you can do this with with large language models, they it enhances the accuracy of response, the context and relevance, and it's called zero shot or one shot learning, um, which um, is another term called in-context learning, which is when you give one or two examples or tries to iterate. But if you're just, if you give a very specific query, that's, you'll get a very specific answer and that's from a called zero-shot learning. So this is a, a, an image that explains prompt engineering, I think quite nicely. So a level zero is, there's no directive. You know, tell me about machine learning. Um, level one might be, um, tell me about machine learning um, in, in a less than 100 words. And at least that's you know, one summary. Level two is sort of a paragraph style where you're expressing you know, specific goals, how things should be done, how it should be written. Level three usually is a, um, a set of instructions, a bullet list type or numbered instructions, um, both the high level goal and the subtask given. And level four, high level goal, sub list, and explicit statement asking to explain what it's just described. And then level five, even higher. Uh, you might even provide examples like level five. Most people are using things at level zero or level one. And if you can put things at level four and level five, you'll see a huge improvement in things like question answering, um, performance, coding, whatever you wanna do. So here's some examples of you know, prompt engineering, explain gene prediction. That's a very open-ended one. Explain the process of gene prediction by informatics, including types of algorithms used. That is more specific. Uh, describe the computational algorithms used in gene prediction, such as Sigma Markov models and one nets, and explain how they identify coding regions and genomic sequences. And that's longer and therefore a level two. Um, if we wanted something in level three, we'd explain that we're not just about eukaryote, but we want prokaryote one. And we want to compare rule based methods and machine learning methods and discuss their effectiveness. Uh, level four is, again, um, more elaborate, more sentences or subsections, probably um, in not enough space to show level five. But this is how you should be thinking about using prompts. And I don't know, um, maybe what I'll do is just... So there are lots of alternatives that people have found and that are now both commercially or freely available. Um, and um, I'll briefly go through some of them. So ChatSonic is a group in Germany. Um, it's built on ChatGPT4. It builds on knowledge graphs. It has citations. It accesses the internet. It has audio capacity. Um, you can use it freely, but um, unless you pay, you're limited to about 25 generations per day. Uh, Gemini is something that you guys may have started seeing or using with especially Google Colab. Um, it's fast very context aware, give citations. Um, it's not an open source tool. A lot of people like perplexity, um, again, because it is, has sorts, uh, sources and citations. Um, there are versions of the free version of perplexity, but then they have the pro versions that use 
CPD4, Mistral, Lama, uh, and a new experimental perplexity model. Um, does anyone, just as a voice out, does anyone use perplexity? Okay, no one. Um, Claude 3, also by Google. Um, it's able to do very well with code uh, development. It's fast. It's sort of limited, so not every country can access it. It's not open source. Uh, Bing, uh, which is cheap, chat GPT-4. Um, it can do web queries, gives visual answers, uh, can give citations. It's not open source. So almost all the ones that I've highlighted here from Bing to Claude to um, Perplexity are not open source. The one program that is open source and that's made a, a really huge impact is Llama. So this is produced by Facebook. Um, you can get versions with up to 400 billion parameters. It was trained on 2 trillion tokens. It's freely available, it's open source. Not quite as good as ChatGPT4, although the 400 billion one seems to match it in almost every case. Um, and uh, if you want to be able to run it locally, you can get a system with uh, a 70 billion parameter model, then you can get a, I think an eight billion parameter model. And you can typically run these on NVIDIA um, GPUs. Uh, you need about 80 gigs of RAM, although you can get away with maybe 40 gigs with a quantized version. To run that locally, it's, it's expensive. The computers are expensive. Um, as we talked about before, ChatGPT isn't just about question answering or um, writing funny jokes or poems or stories or getting your thesis written for you. Um, you can um, do real work. So you can go up to ChatGPT. Again, this is sort of the free version, um, but you could also use version four. And you could, you know, within your query or the chat, say type instructions. So write a Python program for translating DNA. That's the query we used. It's not very specific. It's, it's a level zero or level one query. So we could have said, write a Python program with detailed comments and um, a variety of you know, self-checking routines to, to assess its um, performance and the quality of input data uh, for translating DNA from um, uh, using um, you know, class one and class two start stop codons. Anyways, this is the result. Um, so it usually shows up in a black screen. It um, creates the definition here. It's got the table for the genetic code. Um, it asks you to you know, enter your uh, or output the protein sequence, it gives an example. Um, and the code here is you know, fairly efficient. Um, then the question is, and this was done a year ago. Um, I think people could try the same query and see if it happens, but we can take that, that code, we can go to Google Colab, we can paste in the code. And if we took exactly as we saw it, this one would give um, uh, an error. It's an error message. Um, so um, we can fix it, and we actually did some code optimization by debugging, but you could also, with now Gemini, also correct that. Um, so the function that we had, if you look back, um, which was sort of in the middle um, here, was slightly flawed, and so we modified that, and then it, it was able to give us the correct result. So the first attempt um, on this one using ChatGPT 3.5 wasn't quite good enough. Uh, but you know, some of you could try again if you have ChatGPT 4 or the updated versions to see if you could get one that actually works now that everyone knows how to use Colab. Um, we could also write another Python program to find open reading frames. So recall that was a program that we coded for um, both for the gene finding one in module five, and then for the neural net version with Keras that we had in module seven. Um, here's the result. So it's a fairly short program, whereas the one that uh, we had was um, fairly extensive. We could have again asked it to put in extensive comments and we could have had it to, asked it to have different prompts and 
other tricks. Um, then we can run this through, and here is you know the example. And in fact, it identified correct ORFs, but it didn't have a lower limit. It could have had some lower limit. This you know only include open reading frames that are at least forty bases in length. Um, we could have asked it to also deal with um, uh, reverse um, and forward strands. But the point is that it it knew enough to know what the start codons were, and it knew enough to know what the stop codons are. Um, so uh, again, I think it's quite impressive. Um, the performance is um, certainly as good as most pro programmers could do. So with tools like large language models, because they're good at not only de novo programming, but they're also very good at explaining code and debugging code. So you guys were using uh, Colab, and some of you noticed that there's a thing called Gemini, which is the, the large language model that Google has. There's also a, um, another thing called Cursor SH that we'll talk about briefly. But um, here's an example that's on the upper corner of your uh, Colab. Um, and um, here you can you know, activate Gemini. Um, you could, in this case, um, print hello world message. Um, this is your query, just like with, uh, and you could say, you know, print it in Python. Um, click here, and there's the output. So print, parentheses, quote, hello world, quote. Um, and then this code should print, print hello world. Um, you can then take that printed version, paste it into the Colab window, and then run the cell to execute it. And it executes it correctly. Um, so you could try and go a little further and see if you can get something a little more complex uh, with Gemini. Or as I said, you could do it through ChatGPT and paste it into Colab. You can also use um, um, an inline version. Um, so um, this is how you access it. Um, start coding, it'll generate with AI. Um, click here, so it asks you to print a message. Print the hello, it writes the code, and you can just print, run it, run the cell, point the arrow, check the output for errors. So that's something that you could do, and it's something you could do with the code that you guys have been given. It's something that you guys could do. Um, to maybe even explain uh, or add comments for the code beyond what we've provided. Um, for those of you who are um, into coding, you can also get um, coding programs or um, integrated development environments or IDEs. Um, so it's called Cursor, cursor.sh or Cursor Shell. And it allows you to search your entire code base, generate responses, fix the codes, use its LLM, like Cloud, GPT, and Sonnet. Um, so if you want to get Cursor, uh, it's free. Um, so you can go to cursor.com. You can download it and install it. Um, and with the Mac, it's pretty easy. Probably with Windows, similar sort of thing. Um, once you have it, you download it, click on the install, it open up the Visual Studio Code Editor. Um, it's free for two weeks. If you want the whole thing, it's a $20 a month subscription. But this is an example of, of what it looks like when you're doing code editing. Um, you can write instructions to improve your code. You can accept or reject um, the suggestion. So we highlight a block. We say, please improve the code. And then the red code is the previous code. The new one is written in green. And you can see that it's fewer lines. Um, and um, it's sort of removed some of the redundant code that was already there. So um, if you look again, if you have more time, but look at the red code, as I say, the number of lines, the green code is cleaned up. Uh, you could also chat about your code. So. Um, it might offer some instructions. It can apply the code directly. It can give you information about a prompt. Um, and again, it's not unlike what's, what's possible with um, Gemini. So 
this is intended to be a coding assistant. Um, as I say, whether it's cleaning up, shortening, improving code, um, we'll also help him to write short snippets of code. So again, um, I'm not going to force people to do this, but um, you know, I think we've shown you examples of where ChatGPT can, can do some pretty decent coding um, and do it in terms of bioinformatics and write it out in Python. Uh, I think you can also have it write out in R. Um, if you've been able to use Colab, you'll notice that Gemini is there and that's you know, accessible to Colab. And then we've also shown that you can use the cursor shell to um, help with your integrated development environment. So there, any questions? There is, there is one question from the Slack. Um, can it also be used to convert code from one language to another? Yes, you can. Um, I haven't done it personally, but um, it's it should be able to do it pretty well. Tandra? Yes, I was just wondering about, there's all of these new um, plugins in GPT-4, and a lot of them are targeted towards academic researchers, and I'm sure there's some for coding and stuff, and they all claim to be the best. Um, do you have any experience with these or recommendations, or do you think they're just, it, are they necessary, or is using just the base GPT just as effective? Um. Probably the plugins are, are improved. I, I mean, this is where a general model um, tends to be performed more poorly than a specialized model. Um, and if you you know know the specialty you're in, it's it's probably better to use a specialized plugin. Um, again, it's you know what's available, how easy is it to use. Um, I haven't used plugins for ChatGPT, um, but perhaps others have, and maybe just on the Slack channel, people can comment on it. But as a rule, um, a specialized um, bot or LLM will outperform a general one in the specialty that it's located in. So there are better programming bots than ChatGPT, and there are probably better specialty programming bots within ChatGPT. Um, does that help? Yes, thank you. Anyways, the general observation we've had so far um, is that the, you know once the code is generated, it still needs testing. But if you have done a good job with the prompt engineering, um, you can get really high quality code, and it may not need as much testing and may not be um, not suffer. Um, one of the things also is that. Um, ChatGPT can can kind of learn from its query. So, you know, it produces code. We look at it and say, this code is good, but I know this is a problem with the, um, you know, reading the file or it's producing an error. Um, can you correct that? And then it may fix that on its own. Um, anyways, it goes back to the point of prompt engineering. Produce accurate and precise prompts. And the ones that we gave uh, as for the examples of coding, were pretty general. I, they're level zero or level one prompts. And um, you know, if you get to up to level two or three, you get a much better result. Another application that ChatGPT is useful for is information extraction. Um, so this is trying to take data uh, from a topic. It might be summarization at some level. Uh, it might be translation of unstructured data into structured data. Um, the, this, the key with information extraction, especially in, in scientific literature or with data sets, is being able to do named entity recognition. That's part of natural language processing. So um, you can think about it in terms of the information explosion we have to deal with it in science. So you know, 400 years ago, there were two scientific journals. Today, there's about 60,000. Right now, there's about 500,000 medically related articles published a year, or about a, an article per minute. Cumulatively, all science, it's about one and a half to two million scientific articles a year. There's 35 million abstracts in PubMed, uh, and that only scrapes about um, one third of the known scientific journals. 
And then there's been about 50 million scientific publications published in the last three or 400 years. That's a lot of data. One calculation that was done about 20 years ago was just what you'd have to read if you wanted to keep up with the current topics like breast cancer. You'd have to read, scan through 130 journals and read 27 papers a day. So I'm not sure how many of you guys read about 27 papers a day. Uh, I don't, um, but really, if you want to keep up with the literature, that's what you need to do. So when people started realizing that there is just too much coming at us every single day, and it's getting worse, um, they started thinking about how to do information extraction. And um, natural language processing is a subject that started emerging in the 60s and 70s, and then some early programs started appearing in the 80s and early 90s. Um, but they're fairly primitive. Um, more recently, uh, there are now a number of open source tools that help with information extraction. Um, so things like Gate and Mallet and DBpedia and the Natural Language Toolkit. Um, all of these can do things pretty well, and um, uh, they were popular, um, but things sort of changed um, with the appearance of ChatGPT and other large language models. So here's an example where you can take in some text. So it's free text written by an author in a book talking about um, artificially intelligent robots um, and how mathematicians, scientists started thinking about AI, mentions Alan Turing uh, and how Alan Turing came up with the concept of intelligent computers and, and computing machinery. So, you know, that's a, an introductory paragraph from either an essay or a book. So you cut and paste that in. And the command is, here's the text, extract data classes. And it's saying, I want century, I want date, I want scientist and paper, and put this into a JSON object. So it's, it's doing an information extraction to create a, um, a set of data uh, for a database in JSON. So this is the result. It identified the century, the 20th. It identified the scientist, Alan Turing. It identified the date, 1950. And it identified the paper that was talking about. And it put it in a format for a JSON object. So with the proper quotes, the proper um, syntax, uh, the proper spacing. So it did the request exactly and produced a, a data set that could be computer readable from a human readable free open text. So that's, I think, you know, that's just a simple example. Any of you guys could do that. Um, but you can go further than that. And rather than just sort of pasting text all the time and asking it to do that, one of the things you can do is, um, play with something called Retrieval Augmented Generation, or RAG. Um, and this allows you to create a large language model or ChatGP that's an expert on specific data and specific um, information. So RAG augments the knowledge of a, a large language model with an external collection of specialized information. So it's like you know, cramming for a test. All of us have a fair bit of general knowledge but you know, if I'm going to be lecturing on large language models, I'll spend um, you know a few minutes the night before reading about large language models so that I'm up to speed. Um, and you know, I'll retain and remember um, the papers and information I have probably for about you know 24 or 48 hours, and then it'll slowly fade. The thing about computers is they don't forget, and what's more. Um, they remember every word of the text um, that's uploaded. So it's a form of, um, I guess, a little bit like transfer learning or you know, augmented learning. So if you get the OpenAI Plus account, um, that's the one that gives you access to GPT-4, you can get the custom GPTs. So to build uh, something with a custom GPT, what you do is collect a bunch of specialized knowledge. 
So it could be, you know, the five favorite papers on the topic you want to talk about. It can also take in PDF files. It can take in uh, PowerPoint files. Uh, I've heard it taking in even videos with audio. Um, what ChatGPT does then is take that data, um, which could be, as I say, audio, text, images, PDF, Word documents, whatever. It'll vectorize that, which means basically converting it into one um, big, um, I don't know, text block, but also um, it, to some extent creates a bit of a knowledge graph um, connecting components to each other. And then what you want is then have a, a prompt which tells it how it should be managing that information. And then it'll generate uh, the output. So if you want to make a custom chat GPT, uh, any of you can do it with a chat GPT plus account. Uh, you can go to your chat GPT and you can go to um, explore GPTs, which is on the left side bar, um, clicking on that. Upper right will say create, and then you can create um, your new GPT. That's step number three. And so you can then press configure. First thing to do is then get some files and you can get up to about 20 files with the information. So you sort of drag and drop. And these, as I said, it can be um, plain text, Word documents, PDFs, images, PowerPoint slides, spreadsheets. So you can have about 2 million tokens in each file. So that translates um, to maybe um, about a hundred, well, about a million words. Um, images, uh, 20 megabytes each. Now that's their claim. I think we've tried a few times and sometimes it seems to max out after um, fewer <laughs> articles and fewer words, but um, that's something to be aware of. Um, so you've uploaded your data. Um, then you want to describe um, what it does. So this ragbot is called the chemistry helper. And what it does is it answers study questions from class notes. The instructions um, are simply quite generic. You're going to be given a question related to organic chemistry. As an expert uh, organic chemist, use the provided files to create a clear, concise response to the question. Focus on factual correctness. Um, so this is, this is guiding it. So this is the prompt that you could use for almost any rag. And it's just saying, you know, get ready and you know, be smart. And then what you can do is um, then start with your rag bot and start asking questions or allow anyone else to ask questions. Um, so this is, as I say, the extra instructions the prompt and the prompts can be, you know, this is more expert where it's, it's a level five prompt where you're telling it what type of system it's supposed to be. You're supposed, it's supposed to be evidence-based, be objective, be neutral, be precise, include sources. Um, so with that set of instructions, you'll be able to get very good answers that are precise, that are cited, uh, full use of the data that you've uploaded. Um, but it's just configuring it so that when you or anyone else starts asking questions, you'll get really good, very accurate, very complete answers. Um, it has other tools with this. You can get um, code interpretation, web browsing, image generation. Uh, you can also have it interact with APIs so it can actually generate some images as part of the answer. Um, so you can make it pretty impressive. Uh, once you've done all of that, whether you've added some of these bonus tools or not, uh, you can create the whole thing and then you can start sharing with chat GPT. And so just like the bioinformatics buddy that we talked about, this is a chemistry helper one um, and let people know who, who wants to use it. All right, we're keep on going here. Um, so as I said, people can do uh, RAG for grant writing, paper writing, newsletters, virtual assistants to deal with FAQs, simple questions relevant to your lab, your research, administrative functions, 
student queries, human resource issues, classes, SOPs. Um, so we're starting to make use of these very, fairly frequently within my lab. Um, and we're hearing more and more people starting to use it elsewhere. Um, so this is, you know, it's information extraction from a small number of documents, or it's information extraction from uh, things that you can paste into a chat GPT window. But if you want to do something that's more sophisticated, um, this is using combinations of in-context learning and um, uh, prompt engineering. So in-context learning, it, it's a prompt technique where you um, provide uh, a learning task through examples. So it's a, it's a little more sophisticated prompt engineering, but you say, you know, here is um, some text from you know, reviews and you want to interpret these reviews. Is it, you know, acting is superb, that's a positive sentiment. Special effects are terrible, that's a negative one. The characters were well-developed. So that's what you're asking the computer to say, is that a positive thing or is that a negative thing? Um, so you create this um, structured text which says, this is, uh, here's a, an example, here's a result, here's another example, here's a result, here's an example, here's another result. And this is um, uh, a difference between ChatGPT 3.5, which is you know, fairly brief, and so other characters are well developed, and it figures that that actually is positive. You get to ChatGPT 4, and it sort of interprets things um, and it infers things and it explains why and how it's thinking. Um, so um, query engineering um, or uh, in context learning uh, can be used by giving examples and then we can show how you can take ICL or query engineering to do some biomedical applications. So in this case, we wanted to take uh, an ICL query to extract relationships from sentences. So the sentence is, the LCT gene provides instructions for making an enzyme called lactase. Um, so we want to then say, here's some examples of relations. LCT is a lactase gene that is in codes. Uh, the lactase is an enzyme. Um, so um, we give another example. HSP70 encodes these other ones, and then here's the result of how it's supposed to parse this stuff. So we've given two examples. The third one is, you know, here's this sentence. What does it mean? What are the relationships? So you can do this with, do this with chat GPT, and you get a difference. 3.5 is fairly simple. Uh, four gives you um, more detail and um, is able to extract actually a little bit more information than and what 3.5 was able to do. So these are short sentences, but then you can take, um, again, uh, an ICL structured set and you can have it parse out from this multi-sentence um, thing about four pyridoxic acid, and it can identify um, the chemical types, it can identify um, these, whether it's associated with structure, it can identify whether it's associated with biofluid, um, it can classify in the ontology what sort of thing it is. So this is, you know, we didn't do fine tuning, we're just doing in context learning to by, by providing examples, and then it's able to go you know, further with that and do things that a human could do that would be hard and tedious, and then which now can be in a format that could be used to build up a relational database. So again, it's a form of prompt engineering, but um, it's a way of actually getting uh, the computer or the chatbot to do things that are a little more exceptional, a little more unusual. So I'm going to switch gears um, and talk about large language models for bioinformatics. So the examples we've given here are you know, more general tools that might be, how would you do information extraction, how you would do um, um, you know, create chatbots that are specialized for a specific, specific topic or a specific need in your lab or your group or your research. Um, but LMs, as I mentioned at the very beginning, are things that are able to extract text and interpret text. So 
English is an interpretable text, but so is DNA sequence, so is RNA sequence, so is amino acid or protein sequence. Um, so you can think of what you know large language models are doing is they're just doing translation, and that's a term we use in you know DNA to protein. It's translation. Um, so there's two types of models that people are using. One is called BERT model, and it uses, or it's best for contextual understanding. It's pretty good for question answering, but it's really, really good for text classification. So BERT models are really good for sequence interpretation. On the other hand, the GPT models that we've been talking about are good for generative tasks. So it writes text. Uh, it also does things like language translation. It's not as strong with sequence interpretation, although for the very large models, it's probably getting to be comparable with BERT. Um, so to, to apply things for bioinformatics, you don't use ChatGPT. Um, you don't use ChatSonic. You don't use Gemini. You have to have a downloadable uh, model. So BERT is downloadable, and Lama 3 is downloadable. And just like we talked about with um, any machine learning system, you need to have training data, labeled or unlabeled. Uh, we've talked about the importance of that already. And you can either do um, fine tuning or transfer learning, or you can do some foundational learning. And you guys have already seen, uh, heard about the Atom Optimizer. So that is the tool that's used to fine tune or optimize things. And with sequence data, because it's not parsed with you know, spaces and periods and commas, um, you work with k-mers, like hexamers or decamers or whatever. But that's the, the, the text unit that you work with when you're talking about DNA protein or, or RNA. So um, these are some examples of what people have used. So they you can use DNA analysis and a large language model. It can be BERT or GPT. So you can predict um, effects of DNA variants. You can obviously do um, you know, gene finding. You can predict DNA protein interactions. You can predict DNA methylation sites. You can predict um, enhancers and suppressors or cis regulatory regions. Um, so these are tasks that have been successfully done, and these are some of the examples of programs that people have written. So looking at you know, genome-wide variant predicts, cis region prediction, protein interaction, methylation, splice site. These are all possible with programs called DNA-BERT and DNA-BERT2, uh, iDNA-ABT, Newland, Methyl, Grover, TF-BERT. A lot of these things are downloadable through GitHub. And this is something I've mentioned before, is that um, these are tools. Um, these are langu large language models. The BERT models can run on a moderately hefty computer. Um, the GPT models are too many parameters. So the BERT ones are you know, anywhere from 110 to 300 million parameters. Um, but people have done the work. So you just need to go to these GitHub sites and locally install uh, the software to be able to apply it to your, um, your interest or your task. You can also work with RNA um, analysis. And people have used BERT models primarily for things like predicting secondary structure with RNA, um, predicting rib ribonucleic binding proteins um, or RNA binding proteins. Um, predicting modifications, um, predicting splice sites, predicting protein expression and rates of degradation, um, coding potential um, for certain subclasses of RNAs. Lots of applications. Um, and again, it's just sequence analysis. Um, these are some of the tools. So they have names like RNA BERT, uh, splice BERT, uh, BERT NDA, um, but almost all of them are, are, as I say, variations on the BERT models um, because they're smaller and easier to compute with. Um, and so there's, you know, in this case, there's eight different um, things that have been developed for um, 
RNA applications, then I'm sure there's more. All of these, again, are generally accessible either as GitHub sites or through um, websites. Um, there's also uh, tools for protein sequence analysis um, that can use BERT or GPT things. So predicting secondary structure, um, predicting um, protein functions, post-translational modifications, mutations, biophysical properties, protein-protein interactions, and so on. Now, it's not to the stage where it's predicting 3D structures, but you know, sort of more traditional, although in some cases um, somewhat exceptional applications. Um, so these are, again, examples of um, tools. There is a GPT, a protein GPT-2, but there's a protein BERT and SPRO BERT and KEEP and anti BERT and EDLM and TAPE. All of these are available. And if you want more information about these tools, these large language models, um, you can go to this article, um, which has just appeared in PubMed Central. It's not officially published yet. I guess it's a preprint. Um, but it's, it's a nice review of, of what's possible with large language models. Um, and the types of things that you can do from ontology to multiple sequence alignment, um, um, mutation prediction, and so on. So we're getting to the end. Um, and I, I think most of you probably now pretty worn out, uh, but we've covered a lot of material and we've covered it in a fairly short order. My goal with this course is try and give you guys a flavor of what's possible with um, machine learning, uh, try to give you, I guess, a look under the hood of what the, um, you know, how these programs work, how they're coded, some of the gory details, um, most of which are now hidden from people uh, because of the development of tools like Keras and uh, Scikit-learn. Uh, we've given you guys code. Um, so as I've mentioned before, the code is something you can use um, long after this course, it's something you can adapt to various problems and tasks that you might want. Um, although we've been using the iris problem as sort of a toy problem, it's it's one that um, I think is relatable to, to biology and to classification, uh, but we've done things like um, sequence analysis from secondary structure to, to gene finding. So we've tried to make this course relate more to biology um, rather than, you know, how to buy a car or how to choose music, which is typically how most machine learning courses go. So the focus is on biology and with real bioinformatics problems. Um, I think I've emphasized this a few times that especially uh, neural nets um, is, are mathematically complex. Uh, whereas some like decision trees are, are much more understandable, much more codable. Um, I think what I also wanted to highlight is that if you try to code everything from scratch, it's, it's hard. Um, and, and hopefully that gives you an appreciation of the challenges that people you know, have, have had in both writing, debugging, and, and building code for machine learning. But when you can use various libraries like SK Learn and Keras and TensorFlow, and you can use APIs that are available through um, ChatGPT or, or other building tools that allow you to create uh, very powerful models. It, it should make things a lot easier. But you can't really do machine learning if you don't have at least some understanding of coding. And I think we highlighted that with examples with Keras where you still had to use a lot of code to read and, and check files that you're inputting. You still had to know about one hot encoding or embedding. Um, but in terms of calling and refining and optimizing uh, various machine learning algorithms, um, you know, Keras and SKLearn makes it much, much easier. Um, I think it's important uh, to remember that, you know, classification, regression, um, recognition tasks. Um, I think these are things that are, are more and more becoming available as web servers. Um, 
these are things that can be done very quickly, um, where it's maybe seconds to, to, to perform the operation. Things like um, machine learning problems like predict gene prediction, secondary structure prediction, tertiary structure prediction, um, they are not likely to be easily generalized and they're not necessarily going to be um, something that's available as a web server, um, partly because they take too long um, to run and the resources are, are very, very significant. I think the other point that I want to make is that the chatbots and large language models are really changing bioinformatics. They're changing the coding landscape. And they're changing machine learning in many respects. And I, I think um, those changes are, are going to be dramatic over the next year or two. Um, and we can see already just how number, the number of applications that have appeared um, that use large language models for what was traditionally done through other techniques like artificial neural nets or more traditional pattern recognition methods um, with traditional programming. Um, and given that these large language models are becoming more accessible and the tools for optimizing them more accessible, I think that's gonna be uh, the next big thing. So with that, I think we're almost finishing right on time. Uh, that really wraps up with the, the workshop.